Well, good evening. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church. It's so good to be with you. I want to especially welcome those of you who perhaps have joined us on our YouTube channel for the first time. Uh, this is our weekly broadcast of our prayer time, which we normally hold at 6.30 in the evenings on Wednesdays, and we've been doing it via YouTube for some months now. We're in the middle of Philippians, a year-long study in our prayer times, and we're in chapter 3. Tonight we'll be looking uh, at verse 12 primarily. And you might turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, and as you're turning, let me remind our uh, regular attenders and our members of the email that has gone out that lists uh, prayer requests, uh, new ones as well as some that are ongoing. I don't know about you, but I'm sort of an erstwhile runner. And by runner, I mean I used to jog, I used to enter 5Ks, uh, one 10K, and even a half marathon. But I was never a competitive runner. I never had it as a goal to win races. That was pretty much out of the question by the time I had taken up running. I remember once I ran a half marathon in Kiwi Island in South Carolina. And that half marathon had was run on a half marathon road, if you will. But there was also a marathon associated with that same event. So basically, you had this 13.1 mile route. And those who were entering the half marathon competition ran it once. And those who were entering the marathon competition ran it twice. Now, my total goal for that entire race was don't get lapped. Don't be twice as slow as the winner. And so uh, by a few seconds, I was able to finish my half marathon before the winner of the marathon race crossed the finish line. So I achieved that goal. Not a very lofty goal, I admit. But Paul talks about other athletic competitions that are far more serious. And he likens the Christian life and our spiritual journey to those kinds of athletic activities. It seems that Paul was a first century sports fan, like some of us are 21st century sports fans. And he followed the Olympic Games. And he uses images of wrestling. He uses images of running. He uses images of boxing. And he does so to liken the Christian life to a grueling athletic event that requires discipline, self-sacrifice, and training to complete successfully. We see hints of that in Philippians chapter 3. You will note that the first verses of chapter 3, Paul is telling us his spiritual biography, and he's basically saying, but I don't consider any of those things worth keeping. I think of them as rubbish. I think of them as street refuse. And he says, I count all things but loss, that I might gain Christ. Let's pick up our reading at verse 7 of chapter 3. Paul makes it clear that he is, has a very specific attitude toward the things that are behind, and he has a very specific attitude to the things that are ahead, and a very specific attitude toward the goal, which is the knowledge of Christ Jesus as Lord. Beginning in verse 7, Paul says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through the faith of, in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So Paul is using a metaphor here 
an extended metaphor that is multi-layered. One of them is the metaphor of a race, because he talks about pressing on toward the goal, which is has a prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. And he also likens this race to being about one primary thing, and that is the resurrection from the dead, which really is Paul's culminating event that shows that he has fully attained the knowledge of Christ. He says he counts all things but loss because he wants to know Christ Jesus as Lord and for whom he has suffered the loss of all things and counts them but rubbish. That I may gain Christ, he says, be found in him. Not going to have my own righteousness to do that, but the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And then verse 10, that cry of the heart, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And in verse 11, that order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, he's putting us in a race, and he says that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, that brings a very logical question, I think. How does one attain to the resurrection of the dead? Surely, resurrection is something that has to be done to you. It's not something that you can gain yourself. How may I attain the resurrection from the dead? Certainly, God is going to raise me. I can't raise myself. Well, I think Paul is using the figure of the resurrection from the dead as a metaphor, if you will, for the culmination of the entire spiritual race. And that culmination is having a full and complete and total and immediate knowledge of Jesus Christ himself. Paul's goal is to run the race so that he might know Jesus Christ perfectly. And then knowing him perfectly, he himself, Paul, might be made complete, total, lacking nothing. So let's look at this race, and we're going to look at four things in the race very quickly tonight. Our time is limited. And I think we want to find out, first of all, that we need participation. Paul is essentially telling us, get in the race. If the spiritual life, which culminates in knowing Christ completely, is likened to a race or any other kind of athletic event, how does one enter? Well, the spiritual race to which Paul refers is entered one way and one way only. You enter that race by being called to it, and you enter that race by accepting the call. The race is reserved for those who have been called by God through Jesus Christ to salvation, and the race is reserved for those who have actually trusted Christ and have entered the race. Now, this is a, a dichotomy. This is a uh, paradox that has been uh, plaguing the theologians for 2,000 years or more. But the truth is, you have been called and you have trusted. And those two things put you in the race. You are now a participant. You have to be in the race. And if you're going to live the Christian life, you're going to live it as a race. So the first call is participation. Get in the race. And I would simply ask, are you in the race? Has there been a time in your life when you have trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when you have heard that call and responded to that call, and indeed have joined in the race with thousands and millions of others who've trusted Christ as well? So you're in the race. You've been called. You've entered. You're now actively running. What else do you need? The passage shows us that we need patience. Not only get in the race, stay in the race. Don't quit. Don't fall by the wayside. Don't give up. Just keep running. Well, how do we just keep running? Well, I think there's certain negative things. First of all, don't be discouraged by any setbacks. When you run the race, or more importantly, when you run a life of racing, there will be days in which you don't feel like running. There will be days when you don't run as well. There will be days when you have nagging injuries. There will be days in which you simply can't see the point. Don't be discouraged by any kinds of setbacks. What is Paul saying? He says to the Philippians, listen, you know I'm the Apostle Paul. I've given you my spiritual credentials in Judaism. You know my life. You know my heart. You know my accomplishments. But I want you to understand one thing. I am not perfect, though I long to be. 
I am not complete. I am not totally whole. I am not what I was designed to be yet. And we've got to remember, Paul had been saved 25, 30 years when he wrote Philippians. And beyond that, Paul had been personally discipled by Jesus Christ himself, according to his testimony in, in the book of Galatians. Yet, he was still learning. He was not fully perfect or complete. We could put it this way. His was a work in progress, and he was a work in progress. His work was ongoing because Christ's work in him was ongoing. But notice what Paul's ultimate goal is. It's the resurrection, which we can take to mean the culmination of the Christian hope, according to the commentator Silva. The culmination of the Christian hope. So don't be discouraged by setbacks. It's the culmination that we're looking for, the resurrection from the dead. Also, don't be discouraged by others who fall away. There are some people who enter the race who seem to be doing well, and they fall by the wayside. The book of Hebrews talks about these who have apostatized the faith, and their quitting the race, falling away, failing to persevere, can actually cause us to be discouraged. Don't let it. I think another thing is don't be discouraged by slow progress. Knowing Christ and culmination in knowing Christ in the resurrection from the dead is really a marathon. It is not a sprint. And it never ends. I love what happened at the end of Paul's life. You know, Paul's writing 2 Timothy. It's his valedictory address. And Paul knows for certain and makes it clear to Timothy, I am going to die. This time, the Lord is revealed. I'm going to be executed. This might have been on the docket weeks, maybe a few months after Paul wrote this letter. But notice what happened. Just weeks prior to his certain execution, Paul asked Timothy in, in uh, 2 Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak, which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. In other words, these are my last days on earth. But I want to keep learning. I want to know more about Christ. I want to know more about God. And I am determined to stay in the race and to keep on striving to know Christ until the executioner's axe falls. That's the attitude. Don't be discouraged by slow progress because life in Christ is slow progress. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. It's gain upon gain with characteristic setbacks. Another thing is, keep to the training regimen. There are two athletes that are kind of amazing people right now. One is Tom Brady. I believe he's 43 right now. Tom Brady's starting out um, as a quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this year. And he's been a quarterback for over 20 years. How does he do it? Well, his training regimen is legendary. What he eats, what he doesn't eat. He goes through all kinds of exercises with a personal trainer. He goes through massages. He goes through cardiovascular. He's done everything he could possibly do to keep his body fit and to fight off the ravages of time. Another example is LeBron James, a great basketball player currently in the middle of the playoffs. and He is in his 17th season, yet his workout regimen is legendary. It involves weight training. It involves cardiovascular. It involves diet. Why do these men do this? I mean, Tom Brady is a multimillionaire, and he's married to a supermodel, and she's even richer than he is. He doesn't need the money. LeBron James is a walking, talking corporation. The man's millions are almost uh, beyond calculation. Neither one of these men needs the money. Neither one of these men can gain any more fame. They do it for a goal, and the goal is championships. And they keep on training. They stay in the regimen, and they do it day after day after day after day. 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter, is it not? It gives us tremendous hope about the certain resurrection of Jesus Christ and our certain resurrection because we're in Christ. But how does that chapter culminate? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Your constant day after day regimen is not vanity. It is not worthlessness. You're going to abound in the work of the Lord. So you've got participation. Get in the race. You have to have patience, perseverance to stay in the race. But the thing that keeps you going, the thing that gets you out of bed every day, the thing that causes you to put one foot in front of another, spiritually speaking, is the purpose, your focus in the race. What does Paul say the goal is? The ultimate goal in this race is to know Christ. That's why verse 10 says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul's longing, his goal, is to know Christ. And he likens that to attaining the resurrection of the dead. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 12. After that lengthy chapter that deals with the heroes of the faith, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Why? Why do I lay aside those weights, those things that might trip me up? Why do I lay aside those sins that are going to bring me down? Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then we're told to consider him, seriously think about him, Christ, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Folks, the goal in the race is not to be well thought of by other people. The goal in the race is not to obtain some kind of corruptible crown. The goal in the race is to know Jesus Christ and know him intimately and know him to completion. And the writer of Hebrews says, that's why the thing that you stare at, at the end of the runway, the thing that you look toward as you're running this race, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And you fix your gaze on him and you fix your mind on him. So this goal is to pursue and grab hold of the one who has pursued and grabbed hold of you. What does Paul say? Go all the way back to the verses. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. In other words, I press on, I pursue, that I might grab onto something, but in this case, I'm grabbing onto that which has already grabbed a hold of me, which is Jesus Christ. So in a sense, Paul is using very vivid language here, is he not? Paul is saying that, as R. Kent Hughes put it, Paul's rough-and-tumble words explicitly point to his conversion on the road to Damascus, where the risen, exalted Christ seized him for his own. As Paul trod the road near Damascus, the mighty hand of Christ reached down, seized him by the scruff of his robe, and set him on the path to Ananias' house, and Ananias's house, and then to Arabia, and then to the Gentile world as its great apostle. Here Paul expressed his desire to know the risen Christ because he was in the grip of Christ's grace. Paul's whole pursuit of Christ was Christ-originated, Christ-motivated, and Christ-propelled. So Paul wants to know this one. And I love what 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly. You know, life right now, Paul says, is obscured in terms of the ultimate vision of the goal. I see, but I see in like a, a, a cloudy mirror. And in the first century, they didn't have the bright, shiny mirrors that we normally have. It was usually a piece of metal that had been polished. And so mirrors were hardly perfect. He says, life is like that. For now, I see in a mirror, but dimly. But then, when? The resurrection of the dead. But then, face to face. Now I know, but only in part. But then will I know fully just as I also have been fully known. So that's what he means. I'm grabbing hold of that, pursuing after that which has pursued and grabbed hold of me. And this whole picture is like one of apprehension. 
it's kind of like, you know, you can hardly watch a TV mystery or a movie mystery, particularly police procedurals, I kind of like those. And almost every one of them, almost every episode of some of my favorite shows, you have policemen who are chasing after culprits, and they're running, 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 and usually they finally grab a hold of them, tackle them, bring them to the ground. That's really the picture Paul is using here, of chasing down and apprehending, but in this case, paradoxically, chasing down and apprehending the one who has already chased down and apprehended me. And that's why you need perseverance to finish the race. You need to participate. You need to be patient while you're in the race. You need to run the race with an ultimate purpose of knowing Christ, but then you persevere. And that simply means you finish it. Folks, only those who persevere finish. And only those who finish taste the fruit of Christ's victory for you. So, are you in the race? If so, run it with patience. And you run it with patience because you have a goal, and the goal is Christ himself, and very specifically, complete and total knowledge of Christ himself, who knows you intimately. And those who persevere, according to uh, the book of Hebrews and other passages, are the ones who are going to taste this completely and fully. Perhaps you've been an athlete in the past. Many of us have been, many have not. Perhaps you've seen what we have seen uh, as athletes, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, as the old TV show used to put it. But for those who stay in the race, no matter how fast they run, how slow they run, no matter how much they plod, those who persevere to the end will reach the ultimate prize. And you know what? The ultimate prize is not limited to one person. There's only one gold medal given for any event in the Olympics. But the Lord Jesus Christ has an entire room full of gold medals for everyone who finishes, no matter how they finish. They persevere to the end, to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the race. Help us to participate in it. Help us to be patient and not be discouraged by setbacks, our own or the setbacks of others. Help us to stay with the regimen. Help us, Father, to be completely and totally fixed on the purpose of the race, who is Jesus Christ himself. And Father, we pray that we will persevere, not fall away, not apostatize, but finish strong. And Father, we pray for that day when we all receive that upward call of Christ and that we are received before your throne of grace with great joy. And we thank you for Jesus Christ who persevered himself, who with a joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame and is now set down at your right hand. And Father, there's coming a day when he will welcome us home as we culminate the race. And Father, as the race is culminated, as it is finished, we will know even as also we are known. What a wonderful thought. We thank you for it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. Hope you can come back next week. Or better yet, as you have opportunity and, and safety permits, come and visit us at White Oak Baptist Church on Sunday mornings at 1030 a.m. We'd love to have you in our worship service. God bless you all. Good evening.